Good afternoon to our distinguished speakers and all of our um, very important guests that we have invited for this training of stakeholders on sexual and gender-based violence through harmful <clears throat> practices, um, women and girls access to the SHAR. We are really glad to have everyone on this webinar. We welcome you so warmly. Thank you for joining us for the online training. Um, this is a FIDA Nigeria initiative in partnership with the United Nations Women's Spotlight Initiative, which is being executed by FIDA Nigeria Lagos State Branch. We're pleased to have everyone joining us for this training this lovely, lovely afternoon. And uh, we're speaking, all of us, from the city of Lagos. And uh, we know that some of our participants are dialing in from all over Nigeria and even outside Nigeria. So a very warm welcome to all of you. We're glad to have you here this afternoon. I'd like to hand over to my chairperson, Fida Lagos Branch, uh, Mrs. Philomena at energy to please give our opening remarks at this time. My chair, over to you, Ma. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, my lords, your honors, senior advocates of Nigeria, my CVP, Mrs. Rhoda Privetiodon, our national officers, trustees, representatives of the UN Women, Lagos State Government, NBA, civil society organizations, NGOs, the media, my learned seniors and colleagues, great feeders, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I welcome and thank you for responding positively to our invite to participate in this purposeful, significant, Training of trainers. FIDA is one of the implementing partners in the United Nations Spotlight Initiative project. FIDA is implementing this project in about six states of the Federation. We are working on pillars one and two, which borders on legislative policy frameworks and institutional strengthening. FIDA Lagos intends to do this by ensuring that violence against women experts, relevant stakeholders, civil society organizations, and NGOs whose core objectives are geared towards protection of women's rights are engaged in assessing, developing, and implementing policies and legislations to end violence against women, harmful traditional practices, and to promote women and girls' sexual and reproductive health rights. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, some of the activities we have been working on include mapping, assessment, and validation of relevant stakeholders, parliamentarians, government officials, women's rights advocates, human rights institutions, media, civil society organizations, NGOs working on issues of violence against women and sexual and gender-based violence, as well as harmful traditional practices, such as uh, female genital mutilation. We are engaging these mapped out stakeholders in the domestication and implementation of laws and policies on violence against women and sexual and reproductive health rights. We also intend to develop campaign on the domestication and review of relevant existing laws and policies where necessary and advocate for amendments. Based on the mapping conducted, we strengthen relevant stakeholders' capacities for sexual and gender-based violence and uh, sexual and Right, productive health rights, interlinkages for violence against women, 
and gender-based violence, as well as the harmful practices, including relevant stakeholders identified as key game changers. We strengthen the capacities of state ministries, including women affairs, the justice sector, to be able to use and interpret laws and policies that promote violence, that promote ending violence against women and girls, as well as other forms of gender-based violence. Let me not take the position of our seasoned and experienced speakers by going on and on. Please, I implore you all to listen with rapt attention and also participate actively as we go on now listening to all that our resource persons have to tell us. But before then, I want to call upon our chief host, which is our CVP, to please give us good wee message from the national body. Thank you once again for being our guest. Our CVP, please. Thank you. A CVP. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, CVP. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, my chair. Pila Nigeria Lagos branch, Phil Neji. It gives me great pleasure to be on this webinar this afternoon with you people. As you have rightly said, this webinar training is in collaboration with the EU UN Women Spotlight Initiative. And I would like to welcome our partners, the EU UN Women who are with us in this training, and uh, to also welcome all the wonderful people I've seen shortlisted as speakers. The Lioness Silk, Mrs. Titi Lola Aikin Lawo, Honorable Justice Jimoke Pedro, Chief Magistrate, Your Honor, Kiki Lomai Yeye, and uh, my dear sister, Titi Lola Vaivu Adeni. I want to say I'm quite impressed with the choice of people and so many other people. And then the coordinators from Pila Lagos. Uh, I want to congratulate you for putting this together. Uh, the Chair Lagos has said it all. And so I want to welcome all the, pa the participants on this webinar. It is a training that uh, we, we believe will end up with better solutions to what we are trying to fight against, and that is ending violence against women and children. The discussion is expected to help us in eliminating violence against women, sexual gender-based violence, harmful practices, and the laws available in Nigeria prohibiting same, especially in Lagos, which is one of the implementing states of the UN, uh, EU UN Women Project. At the end of it, too, we hope that it will, uh, stakeholders will be educated on how to mainstream advocacy and programming for elimination of violence against women and, uh, I mean, and sexual gender-based violence and any harmful practices in uh, their organizational work. It is also, like she said, to describe the five pillars of the National Action Plan as it relates to the elimination of gender-based violence. So this training will help us to deliberate on the outcomes. We are, going to, we are going to be deliberating on the outcomes and the findings of the uh, stakeholders uh, analysis that will be undertaken by the UN women on elimination of uh, violence against uh, women and gender-based violence. This training too is expected to help us to explain step-by-step -step methods on how CSOs and coalition networks can conduct advocacies and also critical stakeholders on how to map out in order to achieve our same goals. So I, I am looking forward to this wonderful training. And I believe that at the end of the day, not only FIDA Nigeria, but every participant would have benefited. What more with what is staring us in the face? For the past two weeks, it has been so terrible in Nigeria with this horrendous crime of rape. And so with this training today, I believe that after the training, we will be better equipped to tackle this menace. We will be better equipped to, to address the issues as we, we attend to our, uh, our immediate constituency, and that is uh, the victims of rape, victims of SDBB, 
and all that. So it is my expectation that this will be and will avail us the opportunity to learn and synergize, ultimately to eliminate all forms of violence against women and uh, reinforce our collaborative efforts. I don't want to take much of your effort, I mean, much of your time, but I want to appreciate you for finding our time. It is uh, a break today, but you found our time to be a part of it. So I want to congratulate Lagos Branch and the program coordinating officers and everybody that has uh, put this together. And I wish us a, uh, a successful deliberation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, my CVP. We really appreciate those uh, few words of admonition, appreciation, and of course, um, highlighting the purpose of this training. We really appreciate your presence here, Matt. We know how busy you are. So we really, really <laughs> thank you for joining us at today's training. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, my chair, as well. Yeah. We'll quickly move on now to take the presentation from Lady Edith Uduji. She's the project head for FIDA Lagos, Nigeria, and she'll be taking us on the journey of this conversation, the journey so far on the FIDA Spotlight Initiative Project, its objectives, and to just give us a brief summary of why we're here today in addition to what we have heard from both our CVP and the chairperson. Lady Uduji, I'm pleased to hand over the mic to you now, the virtual microphone to you to please take over. Thank you, Ma. Thank you, my able moderator and uh, thank you, my CVP and my chairperson. I, I plead to allow me to say that the every existing protocol is observed. And um, I'm delighted to also give this brief uh, summary on this uh, particular project. As you all know, FIDA is one of the implementing partners in United Nations uh, Spotlight Initiative project. And we are working on pillars one and two of the project, just like my chairperson rightly said. Pillar one is on legislative and policy framework, context, strategies, activities, while pillar two is on institutional strengthening, context, strategies, activities, and budget. Looking at the context, as you all know, that Nigeria has several laws several laws that protect the rights of women and girls, among which are the VAP, VAP Act 2015, CRA, that is the Child Rights Act 2003, PADV, Protection Against Domestic Violence Laws of Lagos State 2007, and of course, the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, as amended, 1999. Then the verb prohibits female genital mutilation, and the constitution also says that the legal age of marriage in Nigeria is 18. The Protection Against Domestic Violence Laws of Lagos State, the Child Rights Act, are also in place, all in place and all geared towards protection of women from domestic violence, then the GBV, that's gender-based violence, and the SRHL, that's the sexual reproductive, uh, sexual reproductive uh, um, health rights. Now the question is this, now do you know that in as much as these laws are in place, most Nigerian women and girls are unable to claim their rights and entitlement because domestication rate is low. Implementation of these laws and frameworks are also very poor. And because of all this, even with some policies from outdated or requiring revision, there's limited public knowledge of these laws and policies resulting to low awareness of rights in sexual and reproductive 
rights. Even the national agenda policy is not helping matters. So what then does FIDA want to do? The rest of this workshop, because, because there's no time, I am trying to summarize it, just say it briefly. What then is FIDA? What then does FIDA want to do as regards to this pillar one? If you, if you, if you, if you look at it, what we are saying is that looking at the, uh, at the diagram, Permit me to share the looking at the diagram. What are we expected to do? If you look at this diagram, can you see the diagram I'm showing? Where you have the if, then, and because. If women and are you seeing the diagram or do I continue? Hello? Hello, Ma, we can't see the diagram yet. Do, do you want to continue? And then as soon as it comes up, we will let you know. Okay, should I continue? Yes, Ma. Okay, let me Thank continue. You. Thank you. So what we are looking at is this. That where you say that if women, if women and um, the law, if they are not, you know, if they are not properly domesticated and no good policies and things like we now talking about the things that will help uh, women to know their rights, just as what we are trying to now enlighten the public to know their awareness. And then if it's not there, just like we mentioned that they will know how to, they will not be able to know their rights and claim their rights. But if it's there, if there's an enabling, if there's an enabling, uh, legislative and policy environments on, on women and girls, uh, violence against women and girls. It does. So can you see it nice there? Where there is an enabling legislative and policy environment on VAWG and on SGBV, HP, that's the harmful practices, and other forms of discrimination and my lady, you need to help me. You gone on mute. You need to unmute yourself, please. Lady, do you please unmute yourself? <laughs> uh, is it okay now? Okay, what we're trying to say is, is we are trying to look at the theory of change, which is what basically the pillar one is talking about. And where the women and uh, violence against women and girls experts are engaged in assessing, developing, and implementing policies and legislation to end this particular violence against women and girls and promote women and girls, girls' uh, sexual reproductive uh, health rights. And if the implementation of the legislation and policies is properly monitored, then what do we expect? There will be an enabling uh, legislative and policy environment on 
women and girls uh, and other forms of uh, discrimination for um, offenders to be uh, prosecuted. And there will be better, there will be effective implementation of the legis legislation and the policy framework, and it will address every of these problems. It will enable the environment so that the everything, uh, the women and girls will not be vulnerable as it is today because it's because of the uh, lack of awareness and the, uh, do not, they do not know their rights. Then, for instance, the training we are doing is to create awareness, telling them what happens and and uh, we need the, what we need to do. And when we now train the trainers, then they will also train others to sensitize people about this GPV, HP, and the rest. For example, they will know that a girl of 16 years cannot get married to a 60-year-old man. Now, if the experts are trained and these enabling legislations are implemented, What do we mean by when we say it's implemented? By being implemented, we are saying putting these laws into, into practice. When there is domestic violence, then there will be prosecution and proper, there will be adequate uh, prosecution and punishment for the offender. It is also, when we look at the, uh, another, uh, agenda on the strategies and approaches expected and the expected outcome. What do we get out there? You see that it is basically what FIDA is doing to implement the pillar one of this project. And this includes the mapping, just like my, uh, it has been earlier said by my chairperson. I don't want to go over that because there's no time. For instance, we have, we have an existing legal and uh, policy framework to identify the gaps and uh, build up the gap. This is exactly what FIDA has been doing. Like two weeks ago, we had a Zoom meeting where, magist where magistrates Ayeye tried to fish out the lacuna, the lacuna in the protection against the domestic law of Lagos State 2015. And this takes us to pillar two. This takes us to pillar two. And then the pillar two, because of the time constraint, pillar two is telling us about strengthening, pillar two is telling us about institutional strengthening context, strategies, activities, and budget. And in the pillar two, you will talk about the theory of change again in the pillar two about these institutions. And when you look at it again, going by the if, then, and because diagram, if you follow it as it is there, you will see that if relevant decision makers and stakeholders in all sectors of the government are informed and mobilized to address VAWG, including LGBV, HP, and promote women and girls. Then SRHR, and if institutions at all levels and relevant stakeholders have strengthened capacity on ending all this violence as we as outlined, including the sexual gender-based violence and the HP, the harmful practices. And, and, and sexual, sexual reproductive health rights. And again, another if that is if national and subnational planning and resource mobilization bargaining processes are effective in overcoming the hurdles of collective action to address and prevent this.
Hello, ma. My lady, we can't hear you again. Oh, sorry. Okay. Can you hear me now? Can you hear? Me? Yeah, we can. We can hear you now, ma. Okay. Let me just just recap. I said now in the pillar two, we are looking at the century of change, and the pillar two, which is talking about the institutional strengthening, is looking at this graphical uh, illustration again, where if if condition is there, then then and because, and all this, as I've said. You see what is there, we'll not go over all of them again. You see what we get as when, if these are there, then, then, what we expect. Then institutions will develop, coordinate, and implement programs that integrate the elimination of violence against women and girls, harmful practices, and other um, sexual and uh, domestic uh, violence that targets women and uh, and, and girls. And now, when, when it's, uh, it's, it's there, as we have said, then because of that, you will now see that institutional change requires appropriate capacity and adequate funding, as well as political engagement and leadership to sustainably address this uh, violence against women and girls, including uh, LGBTHP and promote women and girls, girls' uh, uh, sexual reproductive health rights. And having said that, this one now, as we have seen, I also want to now remind us that because we don't have time, let me now try to sum it up that we are, there is need for awareness of these laws and they have to be put into practice. And we are, just like the workshop we're having now, we have trained stakeholders, stakeholders like the CSOs and the rest. Then they will now continue to train others to get more trained people who will now go to enlighten and create awareness of how what is supposed to be done and what women and girls need to know in order to know their rights and claim their rights. Now, we look at the context, strategies, activities, and budgets. All what we need to do is to strengthen these stakeholders. As we strengthen them, it will help to eliminate, because the, these people we are talking about, the institutions, are the people that we intend to train, even, even as we are having this workshop now, to create awareness of gender-based violence because they are the institutional strength, as the name implies. So thank you so I much, my lady. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. <laughs> we need to move thank, on. You for <laughs> thank you for listening. Thank you so much. And thank you thank for you, listening. Thank you. Thank. Yes, ma. Thank you so much, my lady, for mm. thank you that for listening. very insightful snapshot. You've given us a very insightful snapshot of what today's training is all about. And we're grateful for that. So we'd like to move on now to the introduction of one of our guest speakers that is um, going to walk us through module one, two, and three of the training manual. I have the pleasure of inviting our honor, Chief Magistrate Tike Lomo Ayeye so please take the, the, the floor. But before I do that, I'll just give a brief profile on Ahono. So Mrs. Kike Lamo Ayeye was called to the Nigerian Bar in 1992. She practiced law for a while before she was appointed as a magistrate in the Lagos State Judiciary in 1999. She rose through the ranks to become the Chief Magistrate Grade 1 and currently she has spent over 20 years as a lower court judge, having served in different magisterial districts all around Lagos. She's currently a family court judge, magistrate level, alongside her regular duty as a criminal and civil adjudicator. She obtained her LLM degree from Unilever 2015, specializing in criminal administrative, family, labor, and industrial relations law. Her honor is skilled in civil, criminal and family mediation and adjudication. She's a member of FIDA, a very proud member, and a corporate member of the Nigerian Institute of Chartered 
habilitors. Diana is often invited as a speaker at seminars, professional workshops, and the academia. She has been invited to speak at various workshops organized by the Nigerian police, FIDA, Lagos chapter, the Law Lady Society, and so many other organizations. She is married with two children. My Lord, my learned silk, um, senior colleague, distinguished participant, gives me great honor to hand over the virtual mic to her honor, Kike Lomo Ayeye. Please, Ma, you can take the mic now. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Can you hear me, please? Can you hear me? Can you yes, hear I can me? hear you. Okay. Yes, uh, good, yes Ma. Uh, uh, my, my lady, Honorable Justice Pedro, Lanet Silk, FIDA President, National and State, Thank you, distinguished ladies. I'm very happy to be here on the training of stakeholder on elimination of violence against women, sexual and gender-based violence, and for practices and women and girls access to sexual and reproductive rights. I take the module one. And rightly, uh, the Me Too movement has brought feminism, women's rights, gender, equality to the forefront of societal conversation and more than ever, more organizations are being inclusive by ensuring that qualified women occupy key positions, countries and state parties are reviewing or creating key legislation to address issues of gender discrimination more than ever before. Men are also being included in the conversation. It's been said that we should be asking the right questions. What are the right questions? Because uh, for us to understand exactly the menace we have on ground and how to go about it, we must be asking the right questions. Now, I just go straight to the first question. What is gender-based violence? What is gender-based violence? I just, everybody knows or has an idea, very good idea, so, about exactly what gender-based violence happens to be. I like to say that gender-based violence is an umbrella term for any harmful act that is perpetrated against a person's will and based on socially ascribed gender differences between male and female. It also includes acts that inflict physical, sexual, mental harm, suffering, threats of such acts, coercion, and other deprivation of liberty. These acts can occur in public or in private. Now, this is the most important uh, thing. Women and young girls are more likely to be victims of any form of gender-based violence than any other gender. I think we, have, we only have two gender, male and female. So it's one of them that is a victim all the, most of the time to gender-based violence. It is also a form of discrimination that seriously inhibits women's rights, freedoms on basis of equality with men. What, they are trying, what uh, this means is that gender-based violence, basically uh, a violence that is based on armoring the rights of women just so that we can prove that women are not equal to men. Now, the issue would be what promotes gender-based violence. We also all know that cultural practices, societal acceptance, religion, among others, promotes uh, gender-based violence. How do we abolish? It has to be laws, legislation, has to combat culture, cultural practices, societal acceptance, and religion. Not only laws, implementation of these laws, then societal, societal ideological shift. How do we think? How do we reason? Just this morning, just this morning, I was listening to a program on TV. It's a social program. Somebody went uh, into a market and was asked a man and a woman, please, what is the, um, whose fault? This rape endemic in the society, who do we blame? Where do we lay the blame? Do we lay it on the, on the victim? Do we lay it on the offender? And do we lay it on the society? And of course, I wasn't shocked when the man said, all throughout the maybe five minutes that he, he was given to talk, he said, ah, the victim, oh, number one to hand is the victim. The way they dress is the way you are dressed. And you know this man, in those days, it's not like this because our mothers, they dress well and stuff like that. So society's mindset, everybody knows that in recent times, somebody that was in Puda, that was in uh, uh, the Gea, was raped. 
and killed. And if I, we must say, rape is most endemic in the north, where they dress very properly. If, that, if there's a way like that. Then, of course, how to abolish gender-based violence is through awareness, such as what we're doing, and activism, such as what went down in Alausa yesterday, you know, with FIDA. I think it's FIDA all over the Federation. I mean, at their different states, uh, teaming up to, you know, uh, come out and say, we say no. Now, what are the national action plan, according to the UN women, United Nations women, what have they laid down as the action plan? How do we go about promo, um, um, uh, abolishing gender-based violence? How do we is prevention, is participation, it is protection of the victim, of the vulnerable. I mean, women and children all over the world have always been classified as vulnerable. So it is the prosecution of offenders. And then, of course, the, promo the, promotion, the promotion of... Um, maybe um, uh, societal uh, shift from all this and the religious shift from all this acceptance of what is wrong as, as what is right. There has to be a promotion of the right culture, the prosecution of, of offenders, the protection of vulnerable, the participation of, of all, just because I've not been raped, uh, they have not raped anybody in my family, but me, oh, <laughs> what's my own? Every even men, and then we need to put a lot of uh, processes uh, in, in place for prevention, whether at the workplace, whether at home, uh, uh, society awareness, and stuff. Now we go on to what are the types of violence we're talking of. The laws have since, we thank God, codified a lot of, they've broken it down. What do you mean when you are talking of violence? We are talking of, I mean, people only envisage physical, but we are talking of economic violence. We are talking of sexual violence. We are talking of physical, mental, and emotional. Those are the uh, recent ads. Mental and emotional. Now, what we go on to, we're on definition of concept. I've just uh, finished with uh, gender-based violence. I go on straight to what are harmful practices, HP, what are harmful practices? Very succinctly, those are traditional practices, harmful widow practices, and um, so many, anything harmful to, you know, that, that hampers the right of the vulnerable in society. Now, VAPP defines that, uh, VAPP defines harmful practices as all traditional behavior, attitudes, and practices which negatively affect the fundamental rights of women, girl, or any person. And it includes harmful practices, denial of inheritance or succession rights, female genital mutilation, female circumcision, forced marriages and forced isolation from family and friends. We are all very aware. We have had at any particular point in time complaints uh, before me in court, several, 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 uh, because, you know, every court, magistrate, high court, are empowered to deal with issues of tradition that comes before them and to declare them repugnant if they are. So even, uh, for instance, some, um, it had come up in um, custody and access to a child that the woman was trying to say that. The woman was married to another person. The man was trying to get married to another person. When they were dating, they had a child. The child grew up maybe about nine years old. They had to, the man had to approach court and say, give me access to this child. And the woman says, ah, he, he didn't pay my bride price. So in our village, I think somewhere in Benin, if you don't do something for me, you don't have a right to the child. I said, where? In this Lagos. I have to carry your bag, Kaya, and go back to your village. In this Lagos state, that uh, 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 practice is very harmful to the health of a child. You know, not, nothing of, meanwhile, you are married. Then somebody is going to pay something on your head so that they can have access to their child. It's totally harmful and it's not going to be allowed. So all this de uh, effectively defines um, gender-based, I mean, gender-based violence. The UN Women Under Spotlight Initiative that have set up this forum, they are finding under various categories focusing on gender relation with aspect to they have findings, they made their uh, data. They have data on uh, index on gender relation with respect to women and girls 
and they submitted based on one gender inequality. They said Nigeria is the highest ranking on gender inequality index. It's number 118 out of 154 countries. Disparity, there's disparity in education, in economic sector, and of course they try to flag it that oh, it's more prevalent in, in the in the north. Uh, that, that, that. And then two, uh, their, their submission on the index physical and sexual violence is that uh, it's still, they said, um, it's still very underreported in Nigeria due to number one, victim blaming culture. And the one I said this morning, everybody blames the victim. When you will not wear long skirt, when you will not cover your head, when I can, we can see all your legs outside your face. Then the lackluster attitude of police force. It is from the police that they will start to tell you, hey, hey, look at you, you came. I, there was a time I had this matter. Very, I cried, and I cried a lot in court. It's very, very sad. Uh, These young girls, very young girls, uh, they, they brought uh, two, two, two against one or something like, three against one, three accused persons, one person. And I said, what was the, the issue? And they said, these girls, Organized that I be raped as a punishment for me. Girls went to pay some boys to rape a friend of theirs. And, you know, they got this girl on the street and raped her and said, well, is this your friend? Friends that told us to rape you for whatever. Maybe um, boyfriend attention or something like that. So this girl went to the police, I think at Pedro, Federal Police Station. I'm sorry about that, my Lord, uh, Honorable Justice. So went to Federal Police Station to make a report. And the uh, police just chased us. Are you 17 year old? Get out, get out, get out. They didn't even listen, nothing. I think because at the end of the day, she doesn't have money to open file or something like that. She was aggrieved. She wanted justice. So she went to do revenge rape. She went to get another set of boys gave them the names of those girls and told them to get them and go and rape them. So the two sets of parties ended up in court. It was a very sad day. Hmm. You know, because they couldn't get justice. So it's like, I'm going to do justice anyway. If I can't get it the way of the law, I'm going to take my revenge. And silencing and shame within the family, the, um, the, uh, the a relative, uncle, or auntie, rapes a child. And they say, ah, let's just keep it in family. Let's not talk about it. Now, the child that is raped is injured. There is no post anything, treatment or uh, uh, counseling, nothing for that kind of child. Then people also feel that, ah, okay, well, part of the index of why it's underreported is that there's slow dispensation of justice. So slow dispensation. Why? That's a whole, whole topic. I'm even writing something on that. Slow dispensation. But by the time people, for example, I have a lot of cases because involving children in the family court. Effectively, since 2015, our criminal jurisdiction in the family court of uh, magistrate level have been taken away because of a small thing that they imported at the back, at the penalty clause of the law from 2011 to 2015. They imported it and said, all offenses punishable in this law, child right law, including rape, which we know is life imprisonment. Or once the penalty is 10 years and above, it goes to the high court. So right now, we are only just playing in the criminal law, um, in the criminal court, family court. We're only just playing um, holding charge, something like that. Just hold them until the they, uh, uh, DPP advice comes on time. No doubt about that. It comes. But then they will now say, are waiting, are waiting arraignment. And they are waiting for three years. I have such cases in my court. Are waiting arraignment. In fact, at that time, you're asking, where's the victim? Where's the family? They are no longer coming. They have moved on. Sometimes even the accused person, defendant, who had been granted, it doesn't come again because for one year, two years, come again, come again. Are waiting arraignment. Are waiting arraignment. Those, that's what slows it down. So when society, they are not saying, um, conviction. When society are not seeing conviction, as at on the first level, a la carte, it's it's bound to uh, escalate the situation. Then um, also under the intimate partner violence, the UN submission, the UN Women's submission, 
something that is tribes due to number one, harmful religious practices. Harmful religious practices. Most religion advocates that you can beat your wife as long as you don't cause grievous harm, you can chastise your wife and stuff like that, or just like take everything in as dished out by your husband. And culture is also one of the um, enabling, enabling environment and laws. Enabling environment and laws um, fuel cultural practices and for religious practices. Section 55 Penal Code is one of the such. Harmful traditional practices includes child marriage, female genital mutilation, harmful widowhood rights, practices, girls' education, and human trafficking. These are the indexes used by UN Women Spotlight Initiative to say that there's still a long way for at least a country like Nigeria when it comes to gender-based violence. Now, the, the, uh, the other section of this is what is sexual and reproductive health right? Very many people do not know this. Uh, it's a new area coming up. There's the death of law or just the lack of will to address and give out sexual and reproductive health rights. Now, I just want to address it very succinctly. Sexual and reproductive health rights, is, it is the concept of human rights applied to sexuality and reproduction. Human rights. Uh, a, a popular, a, a popular, a popular uh, um, musician once said, they can't dash me human rights. It is our rights, human rights. So it's, what we are saying is that sexual and reproductive rights is a concept of human rights applied to sexuality and reproduction. Human rights in relation to fulfill. These rights are in relation to fulfill. Sexual health, sexual rights, reproduction, reproductive health, and reproductive rights. They are separate concepts, but they are intertwined. I like, want to explain one of them just very succinctly. One of these sexual rights, for instance, the right to procreate. Did they give anybody, did the constitution give anybody the right to have children in the constitution? No, it's not there. But you can have children. But international law says that uh, anybody can find a family and have children. Now, the issue would be people uh, in international law will say, for you to have a right, must you marry? That's one of the productive rights. Must you marry to have children? We know nobody gets arrested or prosecuted because they have children outside wedlock. But are these law, are these rights described positively? Now, when you are talking of reproductive, is productive uh, rights, the productive the right to have children, for instance. How should it be defined? Is it the right to have children, the right not to have children, which abortion is part of, or the, the right to be helped by the state to have children? You may want to have children, but you cannot have children by whatever medical condition or concoction. Do you have the right for state uh, aid, like such as the right for surrogacy? The right for adoption, we do have that. The right for all the lesser ones, you know, we do have that. But how about the surrogacy rights? The right to be assisted, or else we are left with black market buying of children, rearing of children, and buying of children. So those are the, so so the lack of all this creates so many ills in the society. That's why the conversation needs to come up. We need to talk about it. We need to demand for it. Because non demand for it are putting some girls in the bush, some poor girls that their family are just farming out into abortion and it's not abortion. What what are these places? Uh, uh, baby factory. Some girls are being given money to farm their eggs. They will go there. They will say, okay, for this period of time, eat this kind of food, drink this, and I will give this money. You come, will farm your eggs. Girls are getting fatter just so that their eggs can be farmed. And what are they giving them? These are reproductive rights issues. Should they, there should be law regulating that so that there's no exploitation, there's no... That is a lot. Now, areas of all these that we're talking about, we're talking of antenatal care, bath attendance, postpartum care, contraceptive practices, abortions, is still illegal. There are so many. I will put that like um, surrogacy laws. What, where are they? Those are reproductive rights. So, but chronic malnutrition, child marriages, and other harmful practices are injuring sexual rights and reproductive uh, rights in Nigeria. I go straight to modern two. 
I go straight to modern two. What does the law say? VAPP began the debate. Is uh, they began, uh, began the debate? It applies. VAPP applies to 2015. Applies to FCT and nine other states. It addresses a wide range, wider range of physical and sexual based offenses previously not captured in any legislation in Nigeria. Covers offenses such as rape, spousal battery, stalking, harassment, and any and other forms of violence abuse. This law aims to eliminate violence in private and public life, prohibit all forms of violence against persons, and provide maximum protection and effective remedy for victims and punishment for offenders. There are 26 separate offenses covered in the Act. It defines rape and uh, breaks down violence. What is economic? It uh, breaks it down to economic violence, abuse. It pro the Act prohibits female circumcision, forceful ejection from home, and for widow practices, stalking, spousal battery. The limitations are just that it applies only in the FCT and nine other states. And then it does not. It does not address spousal rape revenge, pornography, and etc. The criminal code is also a legislation that uh, uh, protects women and creates offenses that uh, uh, offenses which are violence against women. It creates uh, from his section 357 to 360, uh, 363 of the criminal code talks about rape and other forms of uh, violence against uh, women. I'm not sure whether that section harassment is there. I think they, yeah, the section was Then, uh, number three, protection against domestic violence law of Lagos State 2007. That has been trending for a while. This this legislation protects against those in domestic and familiar relationships. I, I once talked about um, a man that came before me asking for um, an injunction to restrain the wife from, according to him, he had moved out of the house from following him around and asking questions about his bank account and stuff like that and I said but Oga you are no longer within that same uh, house you have left so the only thing is probably to go and divorce or something so this law is specific to people under the same roof sharing um, domestic and fam family relationship it protects everybody whether male or female from all forms of violence it also covers a wide range of issues that are also in VAPP Act it is applicable to Lagos residents and offenses occurring within Lagos. I mean, that's why it's the law of Lagos. I mean, we won't we won't punish anybody resident in in Ogun State, for instance, or or if the offenses occur in Ogun State. That's why you know it's it's the, the law of Lagos State. Other state has also uh, enacted just a little bit of what is. Affecting them, Anambra. It's all about infringement of widow, and I think the the south south generally prohibition of infringement uh, of the widows and widow fundamental rights in Cross River. Prohibition of domestic violence against women and malnutrition of widows laws, girl child marriages and females are considered. They just everybody just all they just scripted what is most prevalent. Rivers is all about female circumcision law, or your is a bill protecting inheritance rights of widows and prohibition of harmful practices against widows and other related matters, so on and so on. That's it. It's all in the model. The penal code is another law legislation in the north, applicable in the north, as the criminal is applicable in the south. So, uh, criminal code is applicable in the north, and there's, um, although it's not protective. Uh, Section 55, one day of the penal code, it's impact negatively on the fight against GBV. It permits violence amounting to, not amounting to grievous harm. Kaduna State, Kaduna State, in the whole of the North, is the only state that has domesticated the VABP Act of 2015, which comes with all the cover that the law has to offer for women and, and, and children. I just go on to modern three. Cut it off. Now, modern three is all about uh, what the law doesn't say. What that is the lacuna in the law.
which is uh, uh, as Zalia stated, the lacuna in the law, in the VAPP, in the criminal code, in the penal code, as I've just stated it. Now, what will be the issue? Number one, funding. The act states that NAPTIP is to administer the, administ uh, the provision of VAPP and collaborate with relevant stakeholders, including state based organizations, but does not state how this will be funded. Creating awareness, prosecution of cases, advocacy, and ad activism is expensive. It requires a significant amount of time, manpower, and exp expertise to achieve. Now, I said that sometimes in Abuja, in a feeder forum, that the fact that any course affecting women and children are underfunded is violence on its own from the Nigerian state. If something is supposed to impact positively on women, on women issue, there should be money for it. I mean, all this go, come, wait a while, should not, it's a violent, and it's what we should be campaigning. Why are you violent? Because if a husband in the house is not giving the wife money, it's economic violence with the law. So if in any women cause, you are saying protect, you are saying uh, uh, prosecute, you are saying create awareness, and money is not there, it's a form of violence. The next one is specific measures to ensure implementation. The law is silent on specific measures that, that should be taken to ensure effective implementation of the relevant provision. Harmful practices. We all know what harmful practices are. Now, the definition of it fails to encompass harmful religious practices. I think we must have seen at a particular time, sometimes, uh, I think this was this is prevalent in Calabar. Um, burning of witches, children that they designate as witches. They, they are not the one that uh, they won't allow their parents to you know attain economic uh, fulfillment and stuff like that. So they burn witches, and they, they, there was a there was an NGO uh, headed by a white uh, man set up in that place that are rescuing children left to die on the streets of uh, Cross River because of all these uh, religious, harmful religious practices. We all know that after government and culture, religion in Nigeria is a way of life. Some religious practices are discretionary, dangerous, harmful, and should be categorized as violence against women. Example of this includes forcing women to get married to their partner or face being excommunicated from places of worship. Yeah, you, so you are dating somebody, you get, uh, you get pregnant. So the next thing, marriage or nothing or else don't come here again. And, I mean, these things are very prevalent. This happens me sometimes to their, uh, okay. It's, it, when you're having a relationship, it's even good. What if you are forced to marry your rapist? Some religion, some culture forces women to marry their rapist. Then number four, revenge pornography is missing. Is missing. There was a time, uh, a former Miss Culture of Calabar, uh, was a complainant in a case against an ex fiancee before me in Tinobu. This guy had gone to post a nude picture because she said, I'm no longer interested in the relationship again, I'm moving forward. This guy went to print a um, wedding card and insisted that she must circulate, she must marry him, or else she'll put her pornography, uh, pornography pictures on, on the internet, send it to her, uh, the people who sponsored her because she was Miss Culture. Uh, Calabar across the Amosho, whatever. And of course, when this girl said no, he demanded three million, said three million reparation. We don't know what she's is asking for reparation for. Reparation of what? I'm no longer or something. Mm -hmm. Whatever the case may be, the guy put the picture up. And so that was they, 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 um, there is, there is, um, there is, they had to go under criminal code of Lagos, under section 250 something. Uh, section 259 also, sending dangerous things by post. Some kind of watered down uh, provision like that. It's, which is not depictive, which is not enough for something of that gratitude, putting somebody's um, uh, nude picture on the internet just for event because the person wouldn't marry you. And of course it was one year imprisonment. And so the intrigue started because the accused is a lawyer. So the intrigue started, the inter intermediary, go and see the magistrate, come and me beg this person, come and me beg that person. 
when that didn't work, not that anybody promised to send him to jail, but when that didn't work, then the intimidation started. Uh, petition, first petition, you don't know as in second petition, it just keeps getting very, very wonderful. I mean, and they look at me like this when I came, they didn't talk to me. Maybe uh, they, I know the magistrate is biased. But up to, we were still doing the matter, matter, matter. I jumped for judgment. It, ab about three petitions at the same time. It got to, I think they got fed up in Ikeja and they said, okay, let the case go somewhere else. I don't know whether they eventually finished that matter. That's how desperate the accused people could be. But then at the end of the day, what is, the, what is the penalty is one year, one year imprisonment. That's, that's not at all good enough. So revenge pornography, which as fast becoming, is becoming an alarming trend. It occurs where victim is blackmailed by perpetrator with new pictures. Whatever, this act fails to rightly categorize this as violence against a person. It is a form of violence and it must be so categorized and penalized. It must be criminalized and penalized. Sexual harassment in the workplace has recently garnered global attention, especially in the workplace. This is not specifically covered in the act, but it is. I think it's in the criminal code. I'm not talking about penal code of the North, but I think it's in the criminal code of Lagos states. That one is very good. It's talking about, I mean, sexual harassment. It defined it, the ILO definition, which is also in the, um, uh, the definition given it by the um by the um national industrial court of nigeria that's the definition given it by the national industrial court of nigeria is very is very um uh, but then we need it it it's not sexual harassment don't take place only in the workplace you know i mean my neighbor can just sexually be harassing me all the time i'm in the bathroom you want to come and see me through the window you are waiting for me to come out with too well sexual harassment everywhere it's not only in the workplace the spousal rape, this law is not specific that rape can, can occur between spouses. Now, when we are talking of rape, most people get confused. Society gets confused. Is it not the sex that you gave up today that you are calling rape the very next day? No. We are all spiritual beings. We are all people with dignity first and foremost. Now, there are women that are compelled by their spouses to perform sexual acts that they are, this is one of violation of reproductive rights, uh, pro uh, uh, yeah, sexual rights. To have the right over my own body, to want to do all the kind of demonic sexual styles that people are gathering on the internet or anything. Or, okay, I want to, uh, my husband is married to me, but he cannot just walk into my room and say, I want to, he wants to tie me up. I should back like a dog. I should, I should do some things that will make me die in the spirit. You know? So these are what we want really um, um, espoused on as spousal rape. Then the adoption of the VAPP in states. It's a problem. But then, of course, we can't uh, force any states. Access to reproductive health facility. The act is unfortunately silent on measures to take towards advancing reproductive health rights of women and young girls, as well as adequate access to health facility, which is especially necessary for women and girls in rural area. Now, I just want, there's recently, I think in WhatsApp or something, somebody got raped, and I think he's a young girl under 18, and they went to Lasso, this is our Lasso in this Ikeja. And the report, I hope is, a, is false. The report is that the report is that a suit will not treat unless they, they because they wanted a rape kit so that they can preserve the evidence before they go on to the full, full treatment. And then Lasso said, No, if you are thinking of prosecuting, we are not going to treat you. That's a, an example of in, institutionalized failure and a, a, a barrier to full access of women and girls to reproductive health. Now, the puzzle will be Anna and Tariq were previously married. They have now parted ways due to several issues and Anna has moved on. Anna posts a new partner on her Facebook uh, page. Tariq is furious. Tariq believes Anna is deliberately 
taunting him and vows to ruin a new relationship. He believes that if he cannot be with her, no one else can. He proceeds to post a lewd, suggestive photo of her on Facebook as a means of getting revenge against her. Assuming this occurred in the FCT, under what laws can Tariq be charged? It's a post for all of us. It probably will come before us. Very, and even this was not uh, an, a Zoom thing and we are time constrained. This is what would have gone into full discussion to talk about. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johanna. <clears throat> We're so, so grateful to you. We're glad that um, you have walked us through, through this important um, aspect of the training. Um, I'll just attempt to recap some of the things you have said. In the interest of time, I won't, I won't pretend I'm going to do a full, a full um, a summary. But one thing that you have said that really, really stood with me is that, indeed, we need to continue with this conversation. It should never stop. You know, if I, at the matter of time, till their kingdom comes, it should never stop. <laughs> So we need to talk about it. We need to become the strong advocates and champions really, really pushing this conversation forward. You went, you took us through all the things, um, all the critical elements of the law that are available. And then we went on to see the, in the in inadequacies of our regulations. And one thing that stood out for me was also the issue of revenge raping. I mean, that piqued my interest and with the illustration you gave. So the law, we still have a lot of gaps that need to be closed. Revenge, pornography, and of course the institutional failure in the entire ecosystem. You know, all of these points really came out really strongly and we want to thank you. Um, you've given us a lot for us to reflect upon, even as we continue the conversation outside this forum. So you can be rest assured that uh, we'll keep talking and uh, looking forward to having more um, interactions with you because you obviously you've obviously spoken from the perspective of someone who is not also uh, uh, only um, you know from the knowledge uh, base but you've also shared a lot of practical um, information with us based on your sitting as the chief magistrate and someone who has really really walked through this entire process the good the bad the ugly scenarios that you have witnessed so we thank you so much Johanna and uh, we want to just tell our distinguished participants, please start dropping your questions, your comments in the Q&A icons and the functions and the chat room. We'll be able to pick some of the questions from there and we'll read them out and we attempt to deal with some of those questions. So please hang in there and let's move on to part two of um, today's presentation. It gives me so much joy.